I'm Lance Wall now, and welcome to Firewall. Last week, we began talking about how the news and the Bible are having a strange encounter. We're literally discovering that things predicted uh, thousands of years ago are happening in front of our eyes. Nations are indeed shaking. The entire spirit realm seems to be in a convulsion, and it all is coming to a culmination in an American moment of decision, a literal contest of worldviews over who is going to govern the future. What is the meaning of America? Many of us were surprised, shocked, stunned to discover that our uh, cities could be so quickly engulfed in flames and equally concerned that while Americans all share a sense of desperate desire to get along, that there are individuals, political forces, and strategists that are utilizing racial unrest as a mechanism to overturn America as we know it, to turn our cities into infernos, and to literally disembowel the people from the protection of the police department. In addition to that, some news that we were uh, probably missing is we had the uh, uh, Secretary of Defense, Michael Esper, let me see if I got that story here, who was uh, formerly a Raytheon lobbyist, who was very interested in making sure that there was money that was coming from you to protect his client's interests in Afghanistan in the event that we ever needed military intervention. But he was persuaded to do the unprecedented deed of conducting a press conference to oppose the president who he serves in a statement that would deprive the president of the ability to rely upon the military in the event that rioters and uh, mechanisms of political anarchy would uh, not be able to be resisted by local police. Understand what this means. The president has the right, as presidents have used in the past, as, as Lincoln well understood, that during times of enormous social and societal uh, upheaval, should there ever become a militarized part of the citizenry that threatens the stability of a local government or the community or the survival of the citizens themselves that the president can activate the military as a wall of resistance. But uh, Mark Esper, who serves under the chain of command of the president, decided that he was going to break with that chain of command and that because certain senators that are in the Democratic Party uh, found the opportunity to be able to politically exploit America's unrest to their own advantage. Esper was, uh, was chair-led into making a denunciation of the president's option and strategy of being able to draw on the military to protect American citizens. This is the kind of dangerous uh, behavior that one associates with, for instance, Latin America or South America. If you ever notice that when there's a president who is brought into power in Colombia or in Guatemala uh, or even in Brazil, you will see them flanked by the military. It's always the case in Latin American and Central American countries. You'll also see this in, in China, by the way. And that's because the military is the final arbitrator in terms of power. They have the weapons. They have the organization. If they don't give the nod to who's in power, then that person will not be in power. In the United States, we don't have that experience. We don't live in fear that the military is going to suddenly revolt and stage a coup, or that they will suddenly rise up and have their own Pentagon opinion that is in opposition to the policy of the president. And why is that? Because we elect a president. We did not elect Mark Esper. Nevertheless, these demagogues consider it their uh, duty to be part of the resistance to the American electorate and I think that that kind of behavior is dangerous and should be denounced, and probably many of you missed it, although I only noticed it because I had uh, intercessors, as we often have, praying Americans who would notify me and say that they were concerned that there was the elements of a coup potentially developing within the military. I did not believe a coup uh, is going to happen in our military, but I can tell you now, the political um, influence of party politics in the Pentagon is actually part of the deep state problem that we need to deal with in America. We need to have more time for the president to be able to uproot the political uh, ideologists who actually aren't serving presidents anymore. They're serving their own political party's agenda. 
Anyway, I just want to give you that little piece of information because this, this is a period of time in America where we have to be praying constantly, almost as though we're in, a, uh, we're in a, 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 an ongoing siege of wave after wave of efforts that the devil is making to take America down because America represents the sole force that resists the power of the tyranny of the empirical ambitions of, of China to dominate the world, uh, the uh, Marxist progressive agenda, which would be literally to come to power and make the entire Western Hemisphere into a Venezuela. By the way, I found something out you'll find interesting, that uh, Hugo Chavez's daughter, he's the dictator in Venezuela in the failed experiment of socialism, his daughter happens to be the wealthiest Venezuelan citizen. How does that happen? Well, you can figure it out. How is it the Bidens were able to acquire the wealth that they had uh, when, uh, when they were in office, when Joe, Joe Biden was in office, and Hunter Biden was awarded an unusual access to a billion-dollar um, investment fund? Well, you see the way that China works, the way that socialism works is um, you buy influence with elites for elites, and the elites end up backing your power. This has gone on in America. By the way, I'm sorry to say that as much as I love Ronald Reagan, as much as I like George Bush, the fact of the matter is it wasn't until Donald Trump that we ever had a president that called out the danger and the inequality and the threat of another nation, and China specifically is the nation he's called out. And I would suggest to you that you have to wake up in terms of your own prayers and your own awareness, because when you look at Wall Street and the high percentage of wealth in those corporations that suddenly become politically woke and uh, hostile to conservative voices, the very threat that exists in media itself to deplatform and remove voices like mine uh, from, from the media, those influences, those Wall Street big company influences, not the small business in America that represents the backbone of America's prosperity, but the big businesses, well, those corporate businesses are actually global citizens. They really don't care that much about America. And yes, I said it because it's true. They care more about their, uh, their global system, which is why I fear that if American citizens don't wake up quickly to the multi-pronged threat that is upon us, uh, we're going to find out that uh, the globalist agenda is going to be a different economic system with a different global governance that will reduce the status of America to a third world nation, uh, and those individuals like the Chavez family are in Wall Street and in politics are the ones that benefit from the anarchy. Not the middle class, not the average American, but the wealthy class actually play this game, and they're not particularly interested in the United States winning, they're interested in them winning with money. So, greed is what we're also dealing with. Donald Trump, is the only billionaire in American history that gave up his income, gave up his peace of mind, and gave up his, uh, his, uh, his, his years of ease and, and uh, retirement in order to simply serve America. And he has not been served well, as I just said, from the Pentagon brass and the Senate. But this kind of goes to a quote that I want to I wanna share with you right now. It's from uh, Elton Trueblood. Elton Trueblood is a noted 20th century American Quaker. He was the uh, theologian, scholar and chaplain for Harvard and Stanford University. And he was asked a question by uh, Dr. Uh, Carl Henry. And I remember this question as it was responded to in the year 2000. And what an interesting question. The question was, um, 20 of the leading intellectual preachers in the country were asked, what do you see for the church of Jesus Christ in the future? And Elton Trueblood, a noted 20th century American Quaker, said, by the year 2000, Christians in America will be a conscious minority surrounded by an arrogant, militant paganism. Christianity will be a minority, consciously so, surrounded by arrogant, militant pagan. Well, paganism, and that's, I, I think that's exactly what we're facing today. For centuries, it was Judeo-Christian values, actually, that shaped the culture, and primarily because they undergirded that strong middle class. I think those of us that want to see prosperity, pray for prosperity, we better get a handle on exactly what game is going on, what spiritual warfare is taking place, and what the end game is politically. See, the middle class, if it buys into traditional American values, 
of God and patriotism and family, well, that's an obstruction to the agenda of uh, historic Marxists, for instance, and socialists. You see, because the institution of family and the institution of, of religion have to always be dismantled. China, of course, will have the one-child policy. They will control the family. The left is going to take children away from parents if they think they're indoctrinating them the wrong way. They will break up the coherence of the family unit by declaring a family can be two men and a woman, a man and a man, a woman and a woman. And of course, religious liberty is constantly under attack. And as you can see, uh, the, the same people that are cheering on the angry rioters that are assembling in thousands would not allow hundreds to meet in a local church to worship. We now have an insight into the games being played and it's serious politics for power and I'm afraid the Christians are hand-wringing and nervous and worried about what is the proper response, and I'm listening to some of the most bizarre meltdowns uh, as Christians are going out of their way to try to uh, actually placate the storm rather than rebuke the deception and speak peace to the human condition. But listen to this. My friend Daniel Lappin says something which is quite uh, powerful. He says, the new religion that is now manifesting in the United States is nothing more than secular fundamentalism. That's a curious word, secular fundamentalism. You know, Elton Trueblood had, blood had predicted that the uh, faith, the era of Billy Graham, that the era of loving America and God and believing in the Bible and traditional values was going to go down. It was going to go down, and when it did, the American religion, uh, religion was going to become woke politics. It's interesting that we call it being woke when in fact we're praying for a great awakening the counterfeit awakening is all about being woke. We're praying for the kingdom of God to come. The counterfeit is talking about social justice, which Ben Shapiro has a fascinating take on. It's neither social, nor is it really justice. But Daniel Lappin, with that term, secular fundamentalism, uh, he's saying that religion, anti-Christian religion, that is a religion of atheists and activists, has all the hallmarks you would expect of traditional religion, this counterfeit religion that is rising up among the counterfeit awakening of woke people. It deals with, now think about this, it deals with sin. It deals with misdeeds. It deals with, um, with the sins of the past, for instance. If there was an errant joke um, or a, uh, a, an inappropriate picture from college uh, or a Facebook post, it immediately censors you with harsh judgment. There was an editor of a Philadelphia Inquirer just last week, uh, a 30-year Democrat, by the way, institution, the, the uh, Philadelphia Inquirer. He was fired because he dared make the statement that um, black lives matter and, uh, what was it he said, institutions and property matter also. And that was the unforgivable sin for the Philadelphia Inquirer. So this uh, new religion actually um, will excommunicate you from business, from the faculty, from politics, or from social media, if you dare offend the, uh, the orthodoxy. It's a religion devoid of redemption, however. There is no reconciliation. It's all a pound of flesh for flesh, reparations for damage of the past, and where there is actually healing uh, the Bible makes an interesting verse. It says, let "Not that which is lame be put out, let, let not that which is, you know, lame be put out of joint." The implication is, if something's mending, be careful not to put it out of joint. Well, in this case, what you have is people that weren't out of joint are being indoctrinated to be out of joint. We're in the midst of not only a counterfeit religious revival and a counterfeit awakening with this uh, wokeness but you've got mainstream media and big education. I would say big education is right now the false teachers that Jesus warned about. We're looking at most of these people that are doing the riot and destruction are young people. Where were they educated? They were educated by our darling Marxist professors. 60% of your professors are Marxist, by the way, and parents could care less because we've been ignorant. We're sending our children to go get their degrees, and we're not aware of the fact that the devil is populating the faculty lounge and they're being trained to hate the United States, see it as an evil empire whose acquisition of prosperity and freedom came at the, uh, at the uh, price of other people's lives and therefore the whole thing should be torn down to the ground. Now who would wanna do that? Well, I tell you the devil wants to do that because the one place you're not gonna see that philosophy working is China, Iran, Russia, North Korea, or any of the nations 
where rulers are aware of the fact that this kind of a conspiracy in media, politics, and anarchy is the secret to destroying their power. This growing new religion has taken on and taken over even uh, the Democratic Party. I want to remind you that, the, that uh, when we had the Democratic, last Democratic convention, they had passed a resolution praising the values of religiously unaffiliated Americans. In other words, if the evangelicals make up the uh, right wing of uh, Republican Party, we're actually going to become the party of the unaffiliated, religiously unaffiliated Americas. Americans uh, now have the largest group within the Democratic Party are people non-religious or not expressing faith, and this will be infuriating to some of you, but you need to know what's going on, that the resolution was unanimously passed and championed by the Secular Coalition of America. That's the organization that lobbies on behalf of atheists, agnostics, and humanists. So I'm just telling you the 2020 election is gonna determine what kind of America emerges in the future. And uh, in every culture, there is a sense of the sacred. What used to be sacred was marriage. What used to be sacred was life. What used to be sacred was God. But we've seen the Bible, Christians, Jesus, churches, marriage, babies, all, uh, in a sense, sacrificed on the altar of this new um, religion. But there's a French sociologist by the name of Emile Durkheim that said something that I think is uh, worth everybody learning. Durkheim said that what's ultimately being decided are conflicting conception of what is sacred. To Durkheim, the sacred doesn't have to be a divine or supernatural being. The sacred is anything viewed as exalted, anything viewed as set apart, anything that provides definition and meaning to a larger community. Once the sacred is discovered in a moral community, you know what a person really values. In a sense, you know what they worship. And I would say you know what principalities, powers, and spirits govern a nation by what the nation bows their knee to and considers sacred. And so in Islamic worlds or in totalitarian regimes or if you're in communist China, go ahead and um, say the wrong thing and defile the wrong sanctuary or utter the wrong word of blasphemy against the deity and you'll be swiftly executed or isolated. And so it is in culture. Once the sacred is discovered in a moral community, you know what a person values. Now Durkheim was quick to point out that communities will not tolerate or submit to the desecration of what they consider sacred. So consider with me the spiritual crossroads we're facing as a nation right now. On one side, you have uh, the redefinition of marriage, you have the LGBTQ alliance, you have the, um, you have the racial uh, issues. You have the sin that we would be accused of, of intolerance, if we were in any way seen to be discriminating against um, belief systems that we disagree with biblically. And it's the same with abortion. It's the same with immigration or having a borderless world. It's the same, by the way, with the Second Amendment, your right to defend yourself which if the president can't use the military and the police are disbanded, who else will defend your family? But uh, it is not that one side is using science or evidence and the other isn't. Both sides have their history. They have their psychology. They even have a theology. And you'll find preachers that would line up against me and denounce me um, from here all the way to uh, Fort Worth. In this coming battle, there is no middle ground. One side would be willing to live at peace with the other. The other side cannot coexist with you. And that is the nature of what we're dealing with right now. I want to take a look at a word, though, that comes from the Bible that will be very encouraging for you and uh, hopefully encouraging. I want you to take a look at something from Hebrews chapter 10. You and I would love to have peace, but I would say that God is actually bringing the storm to us so that we can bring resolution. I think this is going to be the greatest hour for the church, and God's squeezing out of us some things we never know we had. In uh, Hebrews chapter 10, the verse uh, talks about the persecution that the Hebrew believers experienced. And I want you to take a look at this really closely. The uh, record, recall the former days in which you, in, you were, uh, when you were illuminated, this writer says. We don't know who the writer is. 
but they were writing to the Hebrew community. And they said, remember you endured a great struggle with suffering, partly while you were made a spectacle or a gazing stock is the King James Version, partly while you were made a spectacle, uh, both by reproaches and tribulation and partly while you became companions of those who were so treated. And then the writer says that, uh, that they have need of endurance so that they can receive all that God has promised them. I want to go in and close in on this verse for a second because the word for you were made a spectacle or made a gazing stock is actually uh, the word in Greek, theatron, which is where you get the word theater from. What Paul is saying is, and the Greek word, uh, we used to this word, or Paul, we think it's Paul who wrote Hebrews, what, uh, what the writer is saying is that the, you are being made someone who is trotted out onto the stage. The Christian community is trotted out onto the stage. Unfortunately, you're not on the stage in order to be celebrated. You're on the stage in order to be scorned, to be laughed at, to be shamed, to be sneered, to be publicly humiliated. The Apostle Paul said, we apostles are, are like uh, an exhibition before the angelic realm and, and the spirit realm. Uh, where the off scourge of all things, the true apostolic, ends up going into the theater of human spectacle and in front of the cameras to a scoffing audience, we make our humble defense for believing in God. And the Apostle Paul and the writer of Hebrews says, embrace it. Embrace it. And we embrace it because we have Jesus as our example. Let me give you an interesting uh, word here. I think you'll find it curious. The gazing stock word here means to become a theatric spectacle. It means to be brought into the place where others will entertain themselves by, by looking at you. But uh, the word combined with the word reproach is beautiful because it talks about reproach would be the word of what other people will do to verbally mock you and make fun of you and belittle you, as you see done uh, mercilessly by late night shows every night with the president. And trust me, they, they, he's, he, if they could do it to him, they'll easily do it to you. But what you've got here is this word reproach. And the word for reproach is literally the word that could be used to describe Jesus center stage as the spectacle, beaten, stripped, and bloodied on a cross, surrounded by his enemies, religious enemies particularly, mocking him, making fun of him. Come down from there if you're really Elijah, if you're really the son of God. Why don't you do something now? That word for reproach refers to the public mocking of that which is being made a gazing stock. And that reproach uh, literally means to insult you and hurl the insults in front of other people. And with that thought in mind, I want you to take another look at the Pelosi clap and see the face of Nancy Pelosi. When the president gets done delivering a State of the Union, what would never have been tolerated with Barack Obama or with even George Bush is done openly with Donald Trump. The difference between Mike Pence as an integrous man and Nancy with her smirking mocking is the difference between whether someone has a religious spirit that reproaches its enemies or whether you have a statesman. But who is Nancy bowing to? Remember the concept of the sacred. What you bow to, you worship. And now you have the picture of what Schumer and Pelosi and Congress is willing to bow to, the manipulation of the masses through political um, anarchy, bowing there at the uh, Capitol Emancipation Hall, you've got Schumer, Pelosi. Had they bowed in prayer with, say, Mike Pence or Donald Trump, oh, wouldn't that be a beautiful sight to see these leaders kneeling together, praying for reconciliation and peace in America. 243 policemen injured, eight killed, African-American police, African-American um, um, service uh, providers, businessmen, properties destroyed. 
They didn't uh, bow and pray and acknowledge that, but they would bow for political purposes. That's the new sacred, that's the new Washington, that's the new worship. And they really should have bowed together for America. Instead, they bowed for power. And that's the reason why we have to stand up and not bow the knee to Baal. Well, we're going to be doing something really interesting in the next um, broadcast. We're going to be talking to a man who has dedicated his life to bringing reconciliation and healing to races and to the United States in particular. And I want you to be able to meet Will Ford. He is one of the most fascinating individuals that I've come across in, in my time working in the uh, ministry for 20 years and in business and media for 20. Will is the director of the Marketplace Leadership. is a major at Christ for the Nations Institute in Dallas, Texas. He has been a leader, a thought leader, and a model of catalytic transformation for many people in ministry. Many uh, have look to him for understanding of the times because his role is to actually bring reconciliation. And that's on the next episode of Firewall. I'm Lance Wall now, and I look forward to seeing you then. So every day I devour a whole lot of information, and I'm looking at all the battle zones, right? So it's media, it's Hollywood, it's politics, it's geopolitical. And you know where I go? I go to something we call the 7M Underground. This is where the information, the journalists, the insider sources talk to me, and I'm able to do the videos and the one-on-ones that we can record and place over here so that you get a lot more depth of content than the one-minute snippets that I'm able to do on the program. So here we even have the prophetic corner because I'm very interested in the futurist perspective. I believe that God does show patterns and blueprints for things to come. And rather than going backwards and saying, oh, so-and-so said this or so-and-so said that and predicted it, I like to go forward. What is the uh, general consensus of what futurists are saying? We take that futurist perspective. We take the news that's happening right now. We take the exclusive behind-the-scenes membership interviews, and we wrap it all up in what we call the underground. It's literally the resistance movement for people that are enlightened on the spiritual warfare that is breaking out in current events. And I welcome you to join me and meet me there. On next week's episode of Firewall with Lance Walmout. Revelation 12, which says the devil is the accuser of the brethren. The word accuser is a powerful word. It comes from the Greek word kategoros. That's where we get the word category. In other words, the diabolical plot of the enemy is to get us to categorize and stereotype each other so that before we can ever have one conversation with anybody, we play some bad narrative or some bad storyline on them. So God was telling me, William, get rid of your bitterness, get rid of your unforgiveness, get rid of any guilt manipulation, get rid of your white baggage so we can all get a new vehicle that can bring revival and justice for everybody. For more information, visit LanceWallNow.com.